So colleagues, um, could I please begin by introducing myself. So for those who don't know, my name is Ian Young and uh, I'm Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University. Um, I'd like to begin with our um, Indigenous welcome um, by saying that uh, we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, university colleagues, friends, welcome here today. Open access is important for Australia as free public access to publicly funded research benefits research, education, industry and the wider community. At ANU, we have been a strong supporter of open access for some time. For researchers, it brings increased visibility, usage and impact of their work. Thanks to the internet, professional practitioners, industry workers and people in other countries unable to afford or avail themselves of subscriptions can now access free research from around the world. Indeed, recent research has shown that open access will increase the rate of return on publicly funded research in Australia by at least 25%. Today's discussion has been jointly organised by ANU and the Australian Open Access Support Group in preparation for Open Access Week, which starts on Monday. We've been very fortunate today to have two very well-known uh, and authoritative speakers on this issue, in that we're joined today by guest speakers Professor Warwick Anderson, the Chief Executive Officer of the National Health and Medical Research Council, and Professor Aidan Byrne, the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Research Council, who are going to share their organisation's open access policies and discuss the progress they've made towards a more open research community. After each of uh, our speakers has presented, uh, I'll then open up uh, the uh, discussion to questions from the floor. So please hold your questions uh, until the end. So could you please uh, join with me in welcoming our first speaker, Professor Anderson, to start the discussion. Thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you for the invitation to do this. It's uh, terrific. Now, I'm supposed to press something that says B on the keyboard. On the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell that I've now been seven years out of being an academic. Uh, I've forgotten how to use a university lectern. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of just set the scene, um, give a little bit of uh, history. I've got ten slides. Um, as a way of, uh, you know, kind of framing the discussion, and, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. He said, hopefully. So this started really for the NHMRC um, uh, before t uh, 2011. This is a, a, a publication in the Lancet, which those who aren't in the medical area, it's probably number two journal in, in medicine in the world. Um, New England Journal of Medicine is number one, probably. Don't, don't tell anybody I said that. Um, uh, uh, which was signed by um, the heads of these medical research uh, funding um, bodies, both government, like us and uh, the UK's MRC and the NIH, but also some of the big private charities, such as Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, which actually was quite a uh, an enzyme in the system of getting this started. Of course, the discussion started a long time before that, um, and uh, I'd really like to acknowledge particularly the Wellcome Trust, which in the medical research area really pushed this uh, uh, issue hard within, within our, our domain. Um, this is uh, the, uh, uh, the next couple of slides are the NHMRC's um, uh, policy here. Um, that's the, the web link. Um, and uh, I, I think I, I would like to emphasise that the motivation for us is many and buried, and uh, the Vice Chancellor uh, talked about the important ones there. Um, but in medical research, um, there are very um, well organised, um, very passionate, highly motivated patient groups uh, in any disease you can think of. Um, um, and indeed in Australia there's a very powerful movement, the Consumer Health Forum, which brings together as a peak body 
um, hundreds of these advocacy groups for people suffering from uh, whatever disease you can really think of. And they have a very compelling case, basically, uh, in that, um, you know, this, this is funded through our taxes um, uh, and uh, we think we should have access to the information uh, that our taxes have paid for. So I would say that's the primary motivation for the National Health and Medical Research Council, which I, for those who don't know, is more than a research funding body. Yes, we, we have lots of money, thank you, to, uh, for the taxpayers to spend, but we also um, are responsible for health ethics in Australia, research, health, health research ethics in collaboration with ARC, with clinical guidelines, public health guidelines, and setting standards and coordinating things between states. So we're very heavily um, embedded in the health system um, and in, indeed in the health portfolio. Um, and uh, we have consumers on all our principal committees and observers at all our peer review process and so on. So they have an absolutely legitimate interest in getting access to the latest research here or around the world that might affect um, their advocacy areas. Um, so I guess that's that first up point there, the principles in our um, um, uh, abstracted from our policy. Uh, but as the Vice Chancellor said, uh, the research community itself benefits from, uh, from uh, making sure that there is access as open and as soon as possible to the findings of research. Um, most of our, the third dot point deals with the fact that hardly any of our grants are a single person grant these days. They're, they're nearly always multi-author and um, uh, multi-chief investigator and also very, very frequently across between institutes and research institutes and universities and hospitals and community um, organisations so that uh, we've put the responsibility of just the first uh, the first uh, name chief investigator and that CIA always confuses my international colleagues when I start talking about Australian CIAs. Uh, and uh, as it says at the bottom, um, uh, that despite this, that all uh, CIAs have a responsibility to make sure that um, it has, that the publications have been submitted to an institutional repository. Um, uh, I'm, uh, grateful to um, Dr. Marcus Nichols sitting on the end here and his uh, colleagues for this. This is uh, the regular NHMRC bibliometric report just about to be released for the period 2005-2009. It's our um, uh, review of the citation performance of Australian health, uh, health and medical research publications. This gives you a bit of an idea of the size of uh, of the issue. Um, so uh, over that period of time, um, as you can see, about uh, 20,000, 21,000 publications supported by the National Health and Medical Research Council out of almost 70,000, 68,000 odd um, total publications in the suite of journals that we classify as health and medical research. So there's not we haven't been through these one by one. Uh, that's not really uh, medical research, it's really nanotechnology or bioengineering, but it's, uh, it's within those set of journals. So 68,000, pretty impressive, but um, in case we get too carried away, there are 2.2 million, dollar, million, dollar, million uh, publications overall in that period of time. Um, and this gives you a breakdown of the individual uh, institutions. You can see that uh, uh, at the NHMRC, um, this is primarily from the university sector, but not exclusively uh, from uh, the uh, robust and um, very active um, uh, independent medical research institute sector at all. And Marcus, while I'm talking about this, I can't see WeHi on there, which just... Is that right? Yeah, okay. So uh, and that's an interesting thing because WeHi is by far the biggest medical research institute but has a policy of publishing when they're ready in quality in their view. I'm not making any you know, editorial comments. As opposed to many, many publications. And they can do that because they're not in the university sector and they can play their own game and uh, uh, it uh, certainly is an outstanding uh, institution. But as you can see, the, the list is dominated uh, by the group of eight universities. Um, uh, uh, three quarters of our 
research funding is administered by the group of eight uh, universities, uh, <coughs> but there are some other strong ones in health and medical research, the University of Newcastle and Flinders in particular, which have had medical schools now for probably 40 years or so. Um, uh, on the right hand, yes, the right hand column there is the percent of those publications who are funded by uh, the NHMRC and for the group of eight it runs between 35 and a little over 50 per cent or so. Um, the, the other uh, relevant um, factor here of course is the joint NHMRC ARC University Australian uh, University of Australia Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research which we of course regard as sort of the general framework of, uh, of uh, uh, the responsibility of both institutions and researchers in terms of uh, publications and making um, their uh, uh, making the outcomes available and um, that uh, code as I hope you all know uh, was published in 2007 and uh, we will probably begin to uh, review and revise it within the next 12 months or so. The most controversial part of the code, of course, is dealing with allegations of research misconduct, but thank goodness that's not the topic of the day's talk. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, in the area of health and medical research, there's a very strong uh, collaborative grouping called uh, Heads of International um, biomedical research uh, organisations that meets every six months um, and uh, um, some of the, um, uh, I guess, bringing to my awareness as head of the Australian organisation, uh, the importance of this issue has come through that, uh, that route. And so this is just a, a little bit of information on our, um, our uh, sister uh, organisations around the world. Of course, NIH dominates the world of health and medical research and uh, their policies really do affect the rest of us uh, just as the US economy does. Um, and uh, they uh, uh, now uh, say that papers must be accessible and at, in PubMed Central no later than six mo uh, 12 months of publication. Um, and the uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research is more like uh, Australia's. Um, those of you who are in the open access uh, group and uh, world will know that there's quite a debate going on in the US um, with uh, 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 in the research councils of the UK which our equivalent the medical research council in the UK is a part of and so they are caught up in the policy that's being made uh, centrally by the councils uh, whether or not uh, they agree with uh, that particular policy, they're part of a, a broader a lot. So that's, uh, that's the topic of great debate within the medical research uh, world and will be discussed further with a meeting in about a month's time in, uh, in London. Uh, as I said earlier, the Wellcome Trust um, kind of really provided the energy behind this, I think, and uh, good on them. Um, Wellcome Trust is a private trust. Um, they can decide what they want to do without reference to government. Uh, I'm looking at Aidan because uh, that's a world we share, uh, or don't share in this case. Um, and um, uh, they have really led the, uh, the charge on this. Um, they've also got very, 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 very deep pockets and uh, they can afford to mandate things and then pay for them in a way that perhaps uh, uh, it's not so easy for some of us. Uh, so just finally, on the implementation of our policy, um, a couple of key things here. Th this does uh, a a apply only to journal articles at this stage uh, for us, uh, not to other published outcomes, because uh, we felt that that raised a whole pile of other issues that we weren't quite ready for. Um, having said that, uh, we have also joined a similar statement um, on the, uh, the, the one I showed you on the first slide about open access to data um, and we are moving slowly but deliberately towards requiring uh, that uh, if we've funded it the data needs to be accessible to the public as well. 
Um, the acute thing for us around this is around clinical trials. You probably know some of the controversy around this, that clinical trials get done and either not published, so nobody ever knows what was found, or if they are published, the data is held confidentially by private sector. And um, um, this has two issues. One, it's very valuable data that, other, that researchers could use. The second part is um, allegations that sometimes um, negative findings are covered up or ignored as part of the analysis. Now, I'm not making any allegations that that's true, but that's certainly what others say. Um, as far as the NHMRC is concerned, um, if you have publication costs generally, including for open access journals, which of course is different to making publications open access, um, but if you do have uh, those costs, uh, there are legitimate um, use of our direct costs of research. NHMRC gives um, salaries and other funding in chunks, in, in this case in $5,000 chunks, and uh, how, how you use that is basically up to the, um, the people who get the grant, provided it's used in direct pursuit of the, uh, the peer-reviewed and approved um, um, project. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, unlike some of the rumours around the place, uh, um, as it says at the bottom and underlined, the policy does not require NHMRC funded authors to pay an open access fee. Um, uh, my general point, our general uh, approach to this is we set the policy, uh, what we want, how it's implemented and how researchers go about their business and how universities set their policies um, is, is entirely up to you. Uh, you just need to be able to um, uh, um, uh, meet the requirements of our, our principles. Um, a few other technical things. Our, our grant system, RGMS, uh, now allows uh, chief investigators to list publications <coughs> leads to grant and their availability in an uh, institutional repository. And uh, during um, uh, probably the first half of next year, we'll be checking um, RGMS uh, to see how that's going, so how, how many uh, researchers have uh, indicated that. That'll be after the next funding round, because that's when people update their um, CVs on, in RGMS. Um, and as it says there, uh, we'll use the final reports in RGMS uh, uh, also as part of our um, um, evaluation of how research is going as part of the, uh, the bibliometric uh, analysis that we do. Um, I, I particularly wanted to thank um, the uh, uh, Council of Australian University Librarians through all this because from day one uh, they've been fantastic partners in thinking this through and I, I honestly think that we uh, wouldn't have got to where we are now and we won't get where we need to go in the future without the incredibly um, consistent and thoughtful and helpful <laughs> support of uh, CALL. It's just been absolutely terrific from the NHMRC's uh, uh, point of view. And of course, uh, uh, it wouldn't all happen without uh, ASHA in place. Um, so I think that's, oh no, that's right. So uh, I'm happy to talk about this uh, also, but one of the things that uh, we've uh, wanted to think about is what, um, what facilities the National Library could um, supply um, to also make the publications more available to the general population. There's consumer and patient groups I talked about at the beginning. And so Marcus and our staff and staff at uh, the National Library of Australia have been talking about this for a while and things are, are proceeding along those lines. Um, for us, we're also under pressure from PubMed Central and the NIH to make sure that whatever we do doesn't set up unnecessary barriers between what they do and what we do uh, and that's still a uh, conversation that will be continued by me when I visit NIH in the first week of January this year. So that's the other aspect of, of this for us is how it links into the sort of PubMed um, uh, movement that uh, the NIH of course um, take responsibility for. So thanks for the opportunity to present.
Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Warwick. Uh, and uh, if you could now join with me in welcoming our second speaker, Professor Aidan Byrne. Thanks, Ian, and, and thanks to the Open Access Support Group. Uh, Warwick's mentioned Call as one of the partners we've been working with, but this is another group that uh, we've had lots of very positive interactions with to try and help us develop something that we think is very important. And I don't want to go over everything that Warwick said, but largely agreed uh, with everything that Warwick said. Indeed, uh, our position, the ARC's position on Open Access, uh, was very closely informed by what happened in the NHNMRC. I do remind people that the ARC also funds health. 10% uh, of our funding does go to health. So the imperatives that Warwick articulates in this domain are equally true for us. But it's also my view that those imperatives are true across all of the research domain. So one shouldn't just confine uh, the open access agenda to the demonstrable benefits that will occur in the health space, but actually I think there are the benefits, and these benefits are, are multifold. They are societal benefits, uh, they are research benefits, and indeed they are individual benefits as well. Benefits to individual researchers making sure their work gets out into the broadest domain as effectively as possible. And if, if you don't tick all of those boxes, uh, I don't think we should be pursuing the open access agenda, but we are. Now, yes, indeed, we were formed, informed in the ARC by the NH and MRC's policy, but we also look very closely, as Warwick alluded to, uh, to the conversations that were happening in the United Kingdom at about the same time we did change our policy. And for that, we, we implemented our policy in what I think is a, a very, I think it's a sensible, but it's a very graduated manner. So if you look at our policy, we've articulated that as of the beginning of this year, for funding received from now on, the expectation is that the outputs of that funding should be open access, so deposited in repositories within 12 months of publication. Um, that does allow us some time. It doesn't say that at the beginning of 2014, for example, every single output from the sector has to appear. Um, and the reason for this, I think, is clear. I think the landscape is changing very dramatically. Uh, it has been amazingly interesting to see how the publishers have moved within 12 months, and I think they are continuing to move and adapt to a changing circumstance. And there are some issues that I will admit that we have not worked out. We, we haven't worked out all of the intricacies for <coughs> publication in humanities. Our policy is different from the NH and MRCs because we include all outputs. We don't just include journal outputs. That is one difference between our policy. So we do have to think about what do we need to do, what do we need to have in place, what changes need to happen in the publishing domain to enable this open access regime to come into place. But we do have some time to do it. You know, the research that we fund from now on, the monographs that appear as a consequence of that work aren't going to appear immediately. There is a time delay built in, but we've done something very important, and that signaled to the sector our commitment to the open access agenda. And I think that's been very important, and it's also been important not only within this country, but internationally. And again, one of the things that has been quite remarkable to plot over this one year and one year only is to see how many other funding agencies have come on board on an open access agenda. And indeed, it was the primary topic of discussion at a meeting that I attended in April of heads of funding councils. So, so it is a worldwide movement, and we are pleased to be part of it. So the issue that for us is important that we have a graduated entry into the open access regime. I do also want to emphasise with Warwick that we are neither advocates of green nor gold, so we are advocates of open access. We are not prescriptive to say that everything should be gold at all. This, I think, was a big mistake that occurred in the UK. They, it might be the end state, but to advocate that at the beginning is, I think, not a constructive way forward. So our rules don't say that it has to be gold access or green open access. Um, we, like the NH and MRC, also allow the research funds that we do allocate to researchers to be used to support publication where necessary. In the past, we had caps on that uh, at a 2% level. We are progressively removing those caps. 
Uh, but again, I do want to emphasise we are not mandating a gold open access model as a way of complying with our policy. So um, early days, and if I'm really honest, um, I actually don't know how the system is going to unfold. Uh, and the changes over the last year, particularly the changes uh, with the publishers, the change in stance, uh, the change positioning of many publishers, uh, has indicated that one would be very foolish to be able to say with any degree of certainty how the open access agenda will look like, or what it will look like, in, in five or so years' time. Um, I can make some predictions of that, and, and if I had to make a prediction, I would be arguing, uh, projecting a view that we are going to see a variety of different models to distribute open access publications. There will still be gold open access, probably prestigious journals in the main. The bulk of publishing, in my view, is going to sit within a green model of some sort, and how those repositories are organised. What is the business model of those repositories is something that is still being worked out. So we have our gold tier, which again, if I project forward, is probably likely to be prestige publishing. And then we have the bulk of publishing in green. And then we have another block of publishing, which is probably almost indistinguishable from posting on the web. And the danger in this scenario is that we will lose something very, very important in the academic domain, and that's the control of quality in the system. Because publishers, uh, do actually provide useful <coughs> services and one of the services publishers usefully provide is a reviewing service and Warwick and I both know how difficult it is to run large scale reviewing processes albeit with volunteer labour from the sector. It is an expensive and complicated process uh, particularly if one tries to do it well. So one of the anxieties in this regime is how do you keep the quality up? And again, this is a very active conversation, particularly among heads of funding councils like myself. How do you keep uh, a focus on the quality within the sector? So I, I think I want to stop because I'd rather take some more questions, but just want to reiterate, we, we have implemented, following the NHMRC, but in a broader sense, uh, our commitment to open access publishing. Uh, it will be a gradation of entry because the outputs take some time to appear and, and we do hope and we're optimistic that the sector will be compliant. I mean, The last thing I actually want to do is to have to set up a compliance mechanism that I enforce. Uh, I really hope that we can work with the sector and the sector is positively responding uh, to a regime that I think is going to provide uh, the best vehicle for researchers to get their work out there, both to improve the quality of the research that they do and improve the interaction that researchers have in the board. And maybe we'll stop there for questions. But thanks, Ian. Well, uh, thank you, Aidan, and uh, thanks to both of our uh, presenters. So uh, this is the opportunity now for questions, so I'll uh, throw it open to questions from the floor. E each of these, because we're recording, I'll try and repeat them. So please, at the back there. So the, the question is repeating the question. So the question goes to uh, the elements of um, image copyright in particular and the visual arts uh, and some of the issues around uh, copyright there, particularly bearing in mind that uh, uh, this is an area where, in some cases, people actually rely on income from this for their, uh, for, for their livelihood. Look, I think that's a really, really good illustration of the complication that you get into and you get into very, very quickly. Um, and, and indeed, we do have a little catch phrase, you know, because there will be circumstances where open access is not appropriate. And of course, if you're producing an output that's got a lot of other images from other sources, um, you, may, you may have constraints on how you can release that. And I think that's an appropriate thing to think about. But you've also put your finger on the changes that are already happening in other places about making images much more readily available. That again has only happened over the last couple of years. Uh, so we have to understand that the whole world is changing in a very, very dramatic way. And uh, open access publishing in the scholarly domain 
is, is quite properly and should be part of that. And what we're trying to do is to signal uh, to, to the sector that we support, you have to be thinking about that. Don't just sit back, try and be proactive on that as well. But fully recognising that there may be some other constraints, particularly in some of the domains that you mentioned. Uh, but as I say, as you say, uh, organisations are digitising all sorts of material and making it widely available through the, through the web and, and through other devices. And um, it's a very interesting landscape that's changing very, very quickly. Thank you. Further questions? Yes, the one over here. So the, uh, the, 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 question, the, uh, the question firstly applauds the, uh, the movement uh, to open access uh, and also the fact that it's going to be, uh, particularly with the ARC, is going to be done in a, in a graduated way. Um, but then really asks, are there particular things that we should be doing in Australia to meet the requirements here, but also to position Australia uh, most effectively, I think, in the international movement to open access? Well, one of the things that I think is where Australia is actually ahead of many countries in the world is it's actually given some thought to repositories. Um, Warwick did mention the support that the Australian government has given to, to universities in particular to build repositories for their data. And you know, the use of those as one of the instruments for open access um, is actually one of the things that, as I say, Australia is ahead of the curve on and can use very effectively for making sure Australian research is out there. Uh, so that you know, the, the sensible use of repositories that are already in institutions and the development of them and the coordination of them, I think, is going to be a critical step. And yeah, that's a, that's a really excellent question. Um, I, th I think the reason we both feel a graduated approach is the right way to go because, as Aidan said, we don't know where this is sort of going to end up. And to have locked into anything too um, uh, concrete um, at this stage pr might have not got us where we might have thought in two years time gee I wish we hadn't gone there because all these things have come up but look I, I accept the, the general premise of your question that um, there, are, there are there are undoubtedly unrealised opportunities here uh, as well as um, you know the, 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 the wish at the core of, of all this um, I think it's partly why we've been keen to talk to uh, the National Library of Australia and Trove because, um, and they've been keen to talk to us too, uh, because uh, it, it does fit with their general view of, you know, if, you, if it's about Australia you can find it here, that sort of approach. Um, but uh, there are huge challenges, there are challenges for us for the thing that I didn't finish with, you know, this is the quality issue. Um, now, I used to be editor of a journal, and of course, the peer review was absolutely fantastic, and all the papers were just tip top, of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> not true. Uh, and, and, but it was, a, it was a screen that was there that um, told people, you know, this is roughly what it's like. And, I don't, you know, it's, uh, um, uh, uh, in this world where people email links to each other every day. Thank you, Colin Steele. Um, uh, th there have been some, you know, r really disturbing um, surveys of, uh, of um, some of the quality control of the open access journals uh, in recent times, which does make one, I guess, uh, at least makes me, I, don't know, I can't speak for Aidan, um, but makes me even more resolute of the quality of peer review we have to do so that we don't just rely on you know, numbers of publications and, and so on, which uh, the research community can be a bit prone sometimes to think is the most important thing. So, um, so I think it's bringing us challenges that side. I think there are opportunities to do something uniquely Australian here. I just don't know what they are at the moment, but you've put us on the spot, I think. <laughs> That the, the your answers from both of you actually lead into a question I had, and that's uh, Aidan in particular talk about repositories, um, and um, I'm aware that there's a proposal from uh, from Call from the University Librarians for a tagging proposal, uh, which would enable us to harvest information from those repositories for monitoring and these sorts of purposes. So I'm just interested in as to where both ARC and NHMRC might be going there. Sort of two answers to that, and you know I've been doing this job for seven years now, so 
I've been to Senate estimates, what's that, 22 times. I know how to avoid a question. Um, um, <laughs> and now, and, and, <laughs> you're prone to say something dangerous then, or possibly even truthful. Um, look, um, no, I actually forgot what the question was, so. <laughs> Senator, yeah, thank you, yeah. So look, I think uh, inherent in the, um, uh, thank God, Jane Holton sits next to me at estimates and can keep prompting me. Um, so I think um, I think part of the reason why we've so w w we put out our policy, you know, a couple of years ago, and now it's quote unquote obligatory. But why we've taken the sort of softly, softly graduated approach is not just um, because of the sort of <laughs> complex issues that arose from the first question, is that. Um, from our point of view, and remember we fund beyond universities uh, a lot, um, is, uh, is to allow the sector to come up with smart ways of implementing the general principle of our policy, I suppose. And, and uh, you know, there's no doubt that, you know, um, the smart, there, there's a lot of smartness around universities. So I don't have a preferred or a particular opinion of, of, of what the sector should do to get the most out of it, because it's going to be your resources, Vice-Chancellor, um, that will need to be uh, devoted to, to that. And um, uh, 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 on the compliance side as well, um, you know, we're taking this graduated approach, but um, the NIH from this year um, have made it uh, a condition of being able to apply to the NIH to have complied with their policy and have their stuff in PubMed Central. Now, um, given our repository model, uh, and uh, I, I think it's a great model because, again, in response to your question, we don't know where, we don't know where this is all going to end up. Uh, again, Aidan pointed out there's a pile of publications now and dissemination of results got nothing to do with scholarly journals or scholarly books for that matter. And so uh, I, I really think that we in Australia should be as flexible as possible so that in one year, five years time, we go, thank God we didn't rush into something other than our commitment to having this open access. And if I could come back, I mean, I, 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 no, 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 I won't. well, I will come back to the question because otherwise I'm wasting your time. Um, I think we do want to work with groups like CORE because what CORE provides is an integrated approach across the university sector. And I, I think we, we, a negative would be that if every institution went down a completely different path, I think that would be just silliness. Uh, CORE already exists and probably the responsibility for managing this activity will sit with libraries, so it does make a lot of sense that CORE is an active player and indeed working collectively to find a solution that is as most universal as one possibly can. So, so we try our hardest to run every single thing we do um, past call just to get their wise advice on that and we'll continue to do that. So we also are of mind to want to harvest in as easy a way as possible whether outputs are actually conforming with our policies. Um, I don't want to get to the circumstance where I say to somebody, no, I'm not going to give you money because you haven't published every single paper. I don't, I mean, we could do that because it will, as Warwick said, be part of the contracts for complying with our policies for getting money. It will be part of that, but how do we actually implement it? I would rather to have a reasonably straightforward way of being able to record and document what fraction of outputs are open access and see that over time creep up to acceptable levels. And I'd like it to be 100%, but there will be instances where it's not 100%, and I'll be happy with that, I think. Um, if it sits at 40%, we have to have a different strategy. But I don't think it will. I think it will, I think society, the publishing environment is changing so dramatically, it will actually go up much, much faster than that. And if it gets to an acceptable rate, and I'm not going to define the acceptable <laughs> rate, um, we'll be happy with that, I think. Uh, and I agree. I mean, I think researchers will want their materials yes. out there where That's it's right. easily accessible That's and right. you know, cited and so on. Oh, lots of questions. So the statement was really around, well, the statement rather than the question, which was really around the fact that uh, Australia is very much a leader in open access monographs. Uh, 
And, and again, you know, if this is a vehicle for getting academics work out, I think it's a much more effective vehicle than the traditional monograph, and that I think will absolutely be the way of the future in, in many discipline areas. So yes, over here. So quite a technical question about grant applications and uh, I guess uh, concerns about just how compliant um, chief investigators need to be uh, when they come around for the next round of, of applications. So I'm a bit inclined to be facetious and say this is my tactic for reducing number of applications or reducing <laughs> number. <laughs> but I won't. Um, so, um, uh, well, w w we say our policy is now in place. And so uh, um, uh, w when people update their RGMS uh, profile as part of their application, we'll be expecting them to complete that, uh, that part. Um, um, uh, uh, so I should probably stop there, but um, uh, um, you know, this is still something in progress and uh, we do realise that some people have um, contractual arrangements that prevent them uh, uh, doing that. Um, but uh, we will incorporate looking at that, um, uh, that level of compliance next year as part of our round. Um, but at some stage, I, I think we are going to have to be the same as the uh, NIH. So if you're not compliant, you're not, you're not an applicant. But uh, again, in the, in the sort of uh, um, philosophy of a graduated approach and trying to bring people with us rather than using it as a, as a compliance weapon, um, uh, we'll be firm but kind. <laughs> If, if you're specifically talking about ARC, if you think about how our policy's been implemented, what we're going to be looking for is for the final reports for re research that we are funding from now on. So you're really talking three years down the track before you require a technical compliance for the ARC's point of view. However, however, um, increasingly, I think we're going to be asking questions of applicants. You know, how do you plan to disseminate your work? Uh, and if open access is one of those that they're deeply committed to, I think the panels will see that as a positive attribute. And again, um, we haven't gone down the story about open data. Um, I actually think that open data is a much more complicated mm -hmm. agenda. So I don't really want to go into it. But nonetheless, we'll be asking people, you know, what are your strategies in your research for data dissemination as well, and that's not to mandate it in any way, shape, or form. But how, as a researcher in your application, do you address those issues will be something that we're, we're looking at very closely. And I, I actually think that's probably a better way of driving compliance as well, to be honest. So up the back next. C could, could I jump in there and paraphrase perhaps a question? Yeah. Um, are you saying that there will be instances where it won't be open in those particular domains. And, and it's an example of a sensitivity yeah. that some parts of it will be clearly able to be disseminated and other parts you have to be appropriately yeah, more cautious. Right. And I, I think you know, that, that's why 100% is not something that we, I would ever mandate. And, and I think it's a nice example. Yeah. Yeah. So, so before I give it to Warwick, because I'm sure you have a view here too, I think that actually points to a very important distinction between open access publications yeah. and open access data. Mm. Yeah. Because the sensitivity around the data makes it just such a much more difficult environment to start working with and having rules and regulations around. The argument that you've already put something in a book which is freely available and then goes to an open regime I think is a very straightforward argument that yeah. you can build. Um, but I think you're really touching on now the difference between open access publication where the intent is to put it out into the public domain. And the knowledge that you have a database available, which could be used for other things, and that's where the medical have increasingly, and you might want to talk more about. Yeah, yeah again, it's a very thoughtful question. Um, just generally, working with human participants in research, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, clear aspect of proper consent to be involved for the, for the participants to be told what 
will happen at the end with the information and the papers uh, developed. So it would be research misconduct not to, not to get consent to um, participants um, uh, on some basis that they didn't know that eventually this will be an academic publication. So it's, it's, a, it's a requirement if you look at the national statement. Um, in Indigenous matters, of course, it's even um, uh, more acute. And so the, the NHMRC uh, has some special criteria for applying for grants involving uh, Indigenous communities, Indigenous people, and requires um, um, interaction with the community beforehand to try and get all these things straightened out before, uh, you know, so what will happen with your data and how it will be used uh, before we begin. And I, I think, you know, this hasn't always gone perfectly by any man, but we've learnt, we the NHMRC and Australian researchers think have learnt quite a lot about dealing generally with the publication because of the insistence that Indigenous people um, uh, uh, made that, you know, they, the communities be treated right, uh, correctly beforehand. Or as uh, the previous Indigenous member of council, uh, Cindy Shannon, said to me on a number of occasions, so here again, Warwick, us black fellas t teach you white fellas how to do things properly, which is probably quite a reasonable comment, really. So a question down here, I think, next. So the question was that the, uh, the policies have been informed by changes in, uh, I think, expectations of openness in society, um, but also how have they been uh, shaped and informed by processes within government that uh, make government uh, more open to uh, taxpayers? So, so Warwick very quickly handed me the microphone. Uh, so, so in some ways I think we are, we are leading the curve on this and again um, it's something that we do knowing that this is something that is probably, is, not probably, is going to be beneficial to the academic community. Open access publication is going to be, in my view, a vehicle for improving society uh, improving research because the wide dissemination of information is uh, the way to really stimulate further research. And it's probably, again, a benefit to an individual because an individual researcher will have their work out there in the public domain and everyone can find it and get recognised for their contribution that they make. So in some ways this is a much easier problem than the one that you're articulating and again, it comes back to the, the complications and the nuances I referred to or inferred about data. And, and having government data available in the broad, again, is a very good idea, but there are caveats associated with that which say that the open access publication is going to be really easy, dead easy. There are no issues at all with open access publication. Now, of course, there are some, but there is going to be an order of magnitude other issues associated with the release of data broadly in including government data. But again, the principle is an important one. Um, you know, the principle here is that this is public money used to support research and that information should be broadly disseminated. And I think it does carry over into government to say that everything that is done within the government purview, if you like, uh, should be broadly disseminated to the benefit of the nation. And so, in some ways, this is at the vanguard of that. It's actually leading that and pushing that. And I think that's a very positive thing myself. So, a question over here, I think. Do you so the question... Do you want, I'm happy to have a bite. Yeah, go on. So, just to try and, try and paraphrase that. <laughs> so, the question... No, not easy. Um, just, let me do the last little bit. So, I think the, the real nub of it was, was essentially looking at the costs around publication. Uh, and I think it probably... It holds whether it's open access or not open access, um, but in, in particular whether, you know, whether groups, what happens when groups are actually uh, essentially disadvantaged because they mm. actually don't have the resources to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to come up with the page charges and other charges which might be associated with publication. Yeah, look, uh, uh, it's, a real, it's a real question and I suppose it speaks more generally to kind of like any change can have perverse effects, unexpected effects which uh, 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 not anticipated and not, not wanted. Um, look, the cost thing is really tricky because, um, you know, if you've got a three-year grant from us or from ARC, chances are you're going to be publishing m most of it, 
after our funding is finished. I mean, you might be incredibly successful and have rolling grants, but, but that's not true of everybody. So, um, you know, there's got, <laughs> it's very hard to link this publication to this grant, given the timing as well. The other thing, as you saw on my slide, uh, at least in, in medical research, is there are so many different funders, you know, the Cancer Councils, the Heart Foundation, uh, Multiple Sclerosis Research Society and so on, um, that uh, when we look at the, um, the uh, acknowledgements of support for so much of our research, it mentions us, but it might mention NIH, it might mention the Cancer Councils and so on. So it's a long way of saying there's not very good direct link between the grant and the publication, you know. So the best we can do is, is, is just to be as flexible as possible. And as I said, we, uh, our, our support comes in $5,000 chunks and, uh, and uh, as long as the research, as long as that's used for the research, we don't ask too many uh, questions and we'll probably ask fewer in the future. Um, um, the, 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 the haves and have nots is a real is a real issue there's no doubt about it um, but the real have nots are the researchers in Africa and uh, Pakistan and places that you know don't have any uh, unless there is more open access that won't have uh, access to those uh, uh, journals so I've got this uh, general statement that NHMRC can't be the solution to all problems, which is where I probably should leave it. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, uh, I think um, uh, um, these are the sorts of things that will come out as we work through here. And um, uh, there is going to be a requirement for institutions to bear some of these costs through ROBG and other things. And that's not simple or easy. And, and if I could be flippant and follow that one on, is that Warwick and I will stand together <laughs> and, and, and can't solve all problems. And actually, if you look at the federal funding for research, uh, as much as is given to us to give back to you is actually given to this man over here in the form of block grants for universities to support research. But that's, that's too flippant an answer. The, the complication comes about the cost of this is that it is embedded in a regime that I think is unsustainable, and that's the increase of subscription costs to your library. And um, it's invisible to the uh, yes, you you don't see this, but but this man over here has to worry about it because it's been going up at whatever five percent plus per year ahead of almost the inflation rate. Now, ten percent. The the argument the argument that is put by the publishers there though that the reason for this cost increase is that the volume of material that they have to deal with has gone up by that factor. So they are just mimicking the increase in the amount of academic publishing that's occurred and that costs. And there is half an argument for that, um, but only half an argument uh, for that. So the real challenge, and again, there is not, I don't see, I don't see a linear transition between where we are now and where we're going to be in the open access world. Um, of getting a reduction in the subscription rates and a transfer to supporting the cost of research at a different point. But at the moment, it's supported at, by subscription rates and that's unsustainable, that's clear. So, so why have we got into this situation? Well, we've got into this situation because I think people have committed to an open access agenda broadly in government and other places, but also technology is an enabling that change. So were we to have this conversation 10 years ago, it would have gone nowhere. Open access has been around for at least 20 years and it's almost gone nowhere. But now the technology exists to do it. And if you have to pick a path through this landscape that I can't see how we're getting from point A to point B, the prediction would be that a disruptive agent, a disruptive technology will come in and say, I can do this and I can do this at a cost that's reasonable. And the publishers are thinking about this very clearly. Can they do this? But of course, the businesses, they want to preserve their 30% profit margin. Right? They want the best of both worlds. So the model that the UK adopted, and I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, I think was quite inappropriate in that they had a specific vote 
a specific amount of money allocated to support gold publication. Now, we chose not to do that. We chose to leave the decision point at your desk. You know, we will give you money and you can use it for publication costs because you're in a much better position than any other mechanism that we could think about. But at the end of the day, that cost has to be shared by us as funders and actually vice chancellors as recipients of other money for government in the fuller package of how research is supported. And as I say, the problem is we don't have any clear you know, steps A, B, C, D, E to get to the final end point. And that's a problem. I accept that's a problem. Uh, but it's not one that I don't think uh, we can get through. I think if you, it's actually, I mean, I think the whole issue of subscription <coughs> design is, is quite, quite an, if you're looking at it from the outside in, you'd say, who designed this system in a sense uh, yeah. that yeah. universities provide the intellectual content that goes into the journal for, per, for free, we provide the reviewers that actually review the material for free, we then pay for the privilege of having our publications in the journal and then we pay for the subscription to read the journal, to actually read Okay, okay the so, 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 so I, have, I have been described as an apologist for the publishers because you should, <laughs> you should add the other things that they do and they do coordinate a reviewing process which does maintain the quality and they do provide archival services and they do provide protection of copyright in places. So there are things that publishers do. So the question is, is somebody else going to come in there and say, well, I can do all that for you in a different way? And that's going to be the challenge, okay. right? And, and if you want an Australian solution, somebody in Australia should say, OK, let's get a, you know, I don't know, uh, what, what's a good acronym for something, uh, for open publishing. Somebody's 16. Yeah, somebody, somebody's 16 to put it all on the app for, for a modest cost. Because there will be a cost associated with it. You've yeah. got to understand that. And there's an opportunity for somebody. But, but again, you know, if you want to look at models of industries that are looking like this, look at journalists and look at newspapers. I mean, this is not a million miles away from that and just see where they've come in 10 years and where they're going. And academic publishing actually is going to be somewhat similar uh, with some sort of change and it's going to be a, probably a radical change as part of that landscape in the next few years. Very exciting because you've got to take advantage of that as academics. There are opportunities there for doing what we're doing and doing it better. And that's the exciting part about where we are. Question up back here. Yes. Yeah, um, I, mean, I mean, I think if I can paraphrase the question there, I mean, you've asked a very important question about where this country should go in supporting major infrastructure. And, and unfortunately, that's a really big question. Um, and we're just a month and a bit into a new government and this government will be thinking about how to do long-term support of infrastructure. It's a question that already a number of people have brought to the various ministers now involved in that and it will be one that we will be active players in, in having a conversation with government about as well because I think it is one of the critical issues. Now I don't have the answer to that, I'm not trying to avoid the question but I just don't have the answer. But I think we both recognise that the provision of infrastructure in Australia is, is a critical issue for us. And, and indeed, I think the government also does understand that. It's just that they have other competing constraints uh, on them as well. But we will be doing our best. I'll speak for me, but I think uh, hand over to Warwick. But we'll be doing our best to make sure that uh, whatever we can do to assist the community in the development of infrastructure is there. I don't know if you want to add. Oh, just to echo, so really, uh, I mean, I think it is, a, it is an urgent issue. Um, it, it, of course, data for us and where we're being pushed really hard at the moment is not data that comes out of research, but data that comes out of the health system and that's held, and there are, there are all sorts of issues around that that I've spent a fair bit of this week on, actually. Um, and that goes back to the question somebody else asked earlier about, um, you know, I think it was um, you, Adrian, about um, data held by governments. I think there is a movement to make it more and more available. You, you know, the, the, there have been systems set up that you can get access to that in very careful, controlled areas so you don't find out, you know, individuals' HIV status or dementia status or whatever. Um, and uh, uh, that's been, again, technology is coming to our help because it's being get, got around by methods like that. But, you know, it, it is inevitable that data and 
publications get pushed together, but publications is this big and uh, data is the size of the ACT. <laughs> So look, uh, colleagues, I think uh, we've gone well past our allotted time now, so I think I might uh, draw this to a close. Um, uh, could you join with me in thanking uh, both uh, Warwick and Aidan, I think, for uh, firstly the generosity of their time, but most particularly, I think, in, in covering what are some really challenging issues in a very open, frank and informative way. Thank you all very much. <laughs>